Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. Story number one. Toys written by you sure I'm not a robot. The crew were worried. The ship was safe, running perfectly and ahead of time. They were sitting around, telling tall tales of strange things that they had seen in space. Except one, one crewman, that was drinking too much coffee and poking at every machine. The human was bored. Finally, they had asked the captain to intervene before something happened. No one was quite sure about what would happen, but none of the stories ended well. Engineer Ellis... I am aware of your time in space is normally more, uh, exciting than this, but you are beginning to unnerve the crew. Are you sure there is nothing you can be doing? Nellis looked distracted. Oh, that, I'm fine. I found something to entertain us all, and it's completely harmless. Space can be dull, so I think this might add a bit of color. Are you familiar with the human festival, Christmas? The captain nodded his head reluctantly. Yes, engineer, I believe it's the Solstice Festival associated with gifts. Am I correct? Ellis grinned. Yes, sir, exactly right. Well, it just passed, and I'd like to give out some gifts to the crew. Totally harmless, ancient puzzle games from our past. Absolutely no technology beyond a little plastic. The captain hesitated. Nothing explosive. No AI involved. Ellis smiled broadly. A simple child's toy from our pre-space days. Not even a battery. I thought the crew might enjoy it. Traditionally, toys are a popular gift around this time, and I remembered this from when I was a child. In many ways, it's why I became an engineer. The captain relaxed. Well, of course, feel free to include the crew in your little festival. Ellis smiled and handed him a small gift wrap box. Then, sir, I present you with the first one. Merry Christmas. The captain bowed to the engineer and left, relieved that his human had found such a harmless pastime and that he was even willing to involve the crew. That would sort out any lingering fears. When he returned to his office, he left the gift on the desk and promptly forgot about it. Ellis spent a happy hour wandering the ship and presenting everyone with a small gift, always with a Merry Christmas and a wide smile. By the end of the middle shift, every member of the crew had a small gift wrap box. They were strangely reluctant to open them despite the captain's reassurances. By some strange coincidence, many gravitated to the canteen with a small box. Did he give one to everyone? Has anyone opened it yet? Well, it's a gift, so I thought I would open it here in company. You know, so we could all, um, admire it. From the general shuffle, that seemed to be the common sentiment. One of the comms operators decided enough was enough. His people were renowned as warriors, and he liked the human anyway. Fine, I'll start. He tore off the beautiful paper and was left with a plain white box. He carefully opened it and emptied out a small cube and piece of paper. The cube was a 3x3 three three construction, each base with nine separate components, each base a different color. He regarded it carefully, raising it to his antenna and shaking it. It's solid, he sniffed it. Just plastic. He picked up the piece of paper. It had a picture and a simple message, Merry Christmas, please enjoy this little toy. Simply get all the colors lined up as shown in the picture. Best wishes, Ellis. He looked at the picture, obviously the same cube but with a new alignment. He cautiously twisted the cube. Ah, it's a child's toy, turns on all axes. 
Whatever a Merry Christmas is doesn't seem very complicated. Around him, the crew were opening their gifts to discover an identical object. The crew relaxed, idly twisting the parts as they began solving the human puzzle. It was a matter of hours before Ellis's comm started to light up. He put it on silent and grinned in the dark. The captain moved hurriedly to the engineering section, finding Ellis assembling some more nuisance tech that would no doubt cause problems. Chief, please, my crew are spending all their time with your wretched gift. They are convinced that there is no solution, and that you have fooled them all with this gift. Ellis looked up absent-mindedly. Really? How odd? He pulled the cue from his pocket and handed it to the captain. I'll tell you what, why don't you take the moment and shuffle that up any way you like, and I'll show you the solution. With a deep breath, the captain turned and twisted the cube until it was as muddled as possible. He had no idea what he was doing, but he wanted to know the answer. He handed it back to the engineer. Ellis looked at it briefly and began twisting it quickly, far too fast to follow. In less than a minute, the cube showed exactly the picture that had come in the box, each of the faces one solid color. He smiled at the captain. There, you see, just as simple as I remember it as a child. Funny how these things stick. Muscle memory, I suppose. Was there anything else? Any captain that hired Ellis needed a serious amount of brain power behind them. He held the cue thoughtfully. Thank you, engineer. I will assure the crew that it is a simple child's game and show them your uh, solution. He left grinning to himself. It was unlikely that the crew would be complaining about the human again. He left the solved puzzle on his desk for all the crew to see. The crew spent hours, days trying to figure it out. An unspoken agreement had arisen that asking the engineer for help was forbidden, but that the captain's gear was available to anyone that could come up with a convincing excuse to visit his office. After a couple of incidents, it was decided that disciplinary meetings didn't count. Things took a turn when one of the junior engineers gleefully announced that she had solved it. Her prospects for promotion dropped rapidly when she announced that she wouldn't be sharing the secret. Ellis relaxed in his department, happily filling with a new idea he had while the crew ramped themselves in knots over the Rubik's Cube. Happy Christmas, he murmured to himself at the pleasant silence. Perhaps next year they would like to learn the rules of Monopoly. End of story. Story number two. The Human's Monster. Written by For Use at Works. Monster, inquired Sergeant at Arms Quarier. I do not know the word. Is it a human food? He asked Human Engineering Tech First Rank, Justin Skursky, as they shared a table in the Italy Science Fleet Survey Cruiser, Amor Armarium. Engineer Skursky, who repeatedly requests to be addressed simply as Skursky, often used colorful language and metaphors that were new to Korea. Skursky replied, You know, like a big scary thing that frightens you and tries to eat you. Sergeant at Arms Quirea twitched his short antenna as he thought for a long moment. We have the Charcarodon on our homeworld. It was a wild predator that hunted us when our species was young and not yet civilized, said Quirea. They only exist now in natural preserves. Their movements are trapped and reproduction is controlled to keep them inside those areas, finished Quirea. Skursky inquired, What do they look like? Quirier's exoskeleton shuddered a bit as he made a memory into words. They have exoskeletons like my people. They stand around one meter tall. They have eight legs and are very fast. They have large mandibles, which they use to inject paralyzing venom into their prey. They usually travel in matrennial family units of five to six. Skursky's eyes grew wide. And you call my planet a hell world. You have giant pack hunting spiders. Sergeant at Arms Quirier chittered mildly, his species version of a polite laugh. 
It was not often that he saw a human be disturbed by something that was not immediately life-threatening. What are the monsters of your world, Engineer Skursky? asked Quirier. Come on, man, just call me Skursky like everyone else, especially when you're off duty, chided Engineer Skursky. He continued, we have stuff like, hmm, I don't know, vampires, werewolves, zombies, stuff like that. What makes those creatures dangerous? asked Quirier. Skursky dove into a short lecture. Well, let's see. Vampires have to drink human blood to survive, and they can take over your mind by staring into your eyes and make you just stand there while they drain you dry. You also can't kill them unless you cut off their heads or stab them directly in the heart with a big sharp stick. Zombies are dead humans that crawl out of their graves and try to eat people's brains. You can't hurt them because they are already dead and don't feel pain. You have to destroy their brain and get rid of them. Oh, werewolves are my favorite. They are humans that look normal but transform into animal hybrids. They get all covered with fur and grow giant teeth and claws. You can only kill them with weapons made of silver. Oh, and any of them bite you, you get turned into one of them. Skursky's personal information device vibrated on the table. Skursky picked it up and read the message on it without noticing Korea's involuntary startle reflex when the device alarmed. Gotta go, Q, said Skursky to Korea, and ready up and moving towards the hatch to the hallway. Engine 5 is giving a trouble alarm. Korea sat in stunned silence. He swore to himself that he would never visit Earth. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one. And until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.